last week I went to my rabbi's house for a dinner, and he commonly plays a game called Stump the Rabbi, and he's actually over there. Stump the Rabbi? Yeah. Do you stump him? Uh, eh, not really, but... <laughs> so it's a setup. He's not. Does he really want to be stumped? Uh, uh, yeah. We know he's a pretty games. knowledgeable guy, though. <laughs> Um, but last week I asked a question, and I wanted to hear your answer about it. Okay, um, what was it? How does modern science, like, interact with Judaism in the right way? So we, have, we fa- constantly we find, like, all these civilizations and new fossils every, almost every week. Um, how does Judaism, like, react to that? So briefly, this is how the Torah looks at it. There's only one God. God created the universe. He created the universe actually in a scientific way, in a logical way. And that's why science exists. If the world was not a rational place and didn't have any laws of nature, there would be no science. So science is essentially the study of God's mind, as Einstein put it. So there's no way that there can be a contradiction between God's mind in creating the nature and the natural phenomenon and all the laws of nature. It can be a contradiction to Torah, which is also God's mind teaching us how to behave. So essentially you can say science is the study of the mechanics of God's universe and Torah is the study of the morality of God's universe. Science is neutral. It's, a, it's amoral. Torah is all about how to behave, how to use science and how to use the world God gave us for making it a better place, for behaving more ethically, with virtue, with integrity, with truth. With truth. A scientist can be a liar. A, a Torah person can't. We all have free will, we make our mistakes, but the Torah says do not lie. And a scientist could be an unethical person. Bertrand Russell once said he behaved unethically, so they asked him, how could you behave unethically? You teach ethics to the university. So he said, I also teach mathematics and I'm not a triangle. You know? The Torah says you have to be what you preach. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but we have to aspire to to be proud and say, you know what? I can teach you about ethics, but I'm not ethical. That's not a Torah language. So the Torah is about integration with a a moral system. Science is about the study of the mechanics of the universe. It's two different worlds. It's apples and oranges. And from a Torah point of view, they're absolutely all compatible. God's mind cannot contradict God's mind. So if there's something that someone discovers in science today, and you say, one second, that seems to contradict the Torah idea, either the science is wrong or you don't understand the Torah idea. That's the way we look at it. There cannot be a contradiction. Now, as far as fossils or other things, it's a rather longer discussion. There's many ways to understand it and look at it. You know, remember when Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden, what did it look like? They saw big trees. They saw stars. So if you were there the first day of creation, the universe was in a mature universe. There were no little uh, plants. There were plants, but there were also big trees. There were stars. A star no means millions of of, of light years away. So the universe was created a mature universe. That's not a contradiction, because that's how God wanted. He wanted to create a mature universe. The thought I had is, why does God allow someone like the evil one, Hitler or Stalin, do what he does? Why God allows people to be evil? Well, a million dollar question. There's a whole book of Job just on that question. But briefly, then the day God's value of our free will is more powerful than him intervening and stopping us from making mistakes. So free will, sadly, takes, includes the possibility of someone doing something really bad through their free will. So you have to really ask the question why God gave us free will, which is really why did God create us in the first place. That's the brief, shortest answer I can give to that question. Some food for thought. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'll repeat it, yeah. The question is about karbonot. The animal sacrifices or offerings that we find in the Torah different holidays, every day, for uh, atonement, for this purpose, for that purpose. I'll answer the question with another question. So I'm like answering two questions. And I remember this very vividly. It was a question that people ask, especially vegetarians and vegan, who ask the question, what right do we have to kill an animal to eat it? We'll get back to the sacrifices. Let's, let's make, broaden the question. What right do we have to do that? Animals have a life. Why, how can we disrupt their trajectory their life, just because we're hungry. (laughs) Now, I have to tell you a story that really, a real true story, it was not. I was giving a class in Manhattan, Upper West Side, and before the class, and people came from all places, and there was one particular person who I saw 
came with an agenda. And even before I opened my mouth, he says, I need to ask you something because I need to know if I'm going to stay in this class or not. Like he was like testing me. And he said, yeah, you eat meat? I said, from time to time. He says, How, what right do you have to kill an animal for you to, consume, for you to indulge yourself? And it was a very, you know, comf- you know, he was not looking for an answer. He just wanted to make a point. So I don't know what got into me. I usually never do this. So I said to him, I just felt, you know, he like uh, provoked me. And he was like being, he was like uh, being nasty. So I said to him, what do you think about a vegetarian that beats his wife? That's literally what I said. And I remember he went crazy. He went ballistic. He stormed out. The guy who brought him stormed out. We went with him. And later I found out that he's both. So I don't know, God put the right words in my mouth. So in other words, you're very sensitive to animals, but you forgot to be sensitive to your own spouse and to your children. And you didn't even realize the hypocrisy. Now, there's still not an answer to the question, mind you, but it was interesting that this, I don't know, I, that's what I said. I must not expect that it happened. And later, by the way, he met me again and uh, he apologized because he wasn't a very angry place and he, he needed his own help. So I'm not validating his question, but you have to also put things into context. So it's an excellent question. It's an excellent question. But I have to tell you a story with the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe was sitting at a table, a Shabbos table, and there was someone sitting there who was vegetarian, was not eating from the meat. So the Rebbe Rashab, someone told the Rebbe Rashab, he's a vegetarian. So the Rebbe Rashab said, and what's going on in the world of, the, of vegetation, he does, he, he does know what's going on in the world of vegetation. That was the Rebbe Rashab's expression. What does that mean? And why don't you ask the question, how can you eat a vegetable or an apple or an orange? Oh, because they don't shed blood? But how do you know? Maybe we don't understand their language. They also have a family. And what about the mineral world? Why did you suddenly decide to be sensitive to the animals? Why not to everything? So someone will say, listen, then I'll die. I have to eat something. Is that an answer? That's not a justification. And actually, this question is asked in, in Kabbalistic texts and a Hasidus. What right do we have to touch even a mineral, not just an animal? And there's only one answer that we have. And that is that the one who created it all gave us that right. But not a right. It's actually an obligation. And this is the answer. The Mishnah says in Sanhedrin, in the Talmud, asks the question, why was the young human being created last? If the human being is the crown jewel of creation, the one that's meant to elevate and refine the universe, so why was the human being created last? He should be created first. And the, t- and the Mishnah gives two answers, seemingly contradictory answers. One is because when you set a table and you invite guests, you don't first bring the guests to the table. You first set the table and everything is prepared. Then comes the guest. So God prepared the entire world. And then the guest arrives. Second answer is given that in case a human being misbehaves, the Torah tells us, don't think you're so special. Even an insect was created before you. Even the lowly mosquito, Zvuv, Yitush, was created before you. Now, the first answer is you're the crown jewel, you're the great guest. The second is that you're less even inferior to an insect. How do you explain it? Very obvious, the Hasidic expression that when a wicked person walks on the street, the cobblestones cry out, what right do you have to walk and tread on me? I never transgressed God's will, and you did. What right do you have to step on me, wicked man? In other words, we were created and put into this sacred universe to elevate it. And if we indulge, even walking with our foot on a stone, we don't have a right to do that. Because why should the stone bear our, bear our, bear our uh, footprints when the stone never did anything wrong? So look at it this way. You're hungry. You're walking in a field. You're really hungry and thirsty. You see a juicy uh, apple. If you don't like apples, just replace it with a fruit you do like. I'm just making that point in case... Uh, so I once gave a talk about it, and someone said to me, why apple? I hate apples. So I said, it's not the point. It's the oranges. I hate oranges too. Can you find something you like? You know, whatever. I'm just making that point because it can be clear. Um, it's not like uh, discriminating against non-apple eaters or something. Um, 
talking about being sensitive, right? <laughs> so, okay, so you're really hungry and you can't wait to take that apple, juicy apple. And you gobble it down and now you're refreshed and that's that. How does the Torah look at that? That looks like you did something. What right is because you're hungry? Why should the apple suffer because you're hungry? However, if you made a blessing on the apple and you ate it and the energy you gained from it, you did, you used to do a mitzvah to help another person and the apple thanks you because while it was hanging on the tree, you could never help another person. And now that it became your flesh and blood and you did a good deed, the apple becomes part of your good deed. And if you do, God forbid, a bad deed, then the apple becomes part of your bad deed and you have no right to destroy another life for your indulgence. That's how Judaism thinks. The Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Chabad Rebbe, was a little child who was walking with his father in the woods. They were taking a walk with his father, Rabbi Shalom de Ber, the Rebbe Rashab. And the little boy, Rabbi Yisuf Yitzhak, the Rebbe, would later be the Friedrich Rebbe, the Rebbe's father-in-law, tore off a leaf from a tree and began to rub it. You know, nonchalantly just rubbing it. And the Rebbe Rashab reprimanded him with a long talk and said, what right do you have to interfere with the trajectory and the journey of that leaf. That's the sensitivity we have, Torah has. Baal you can't destroy even one fiber of existence. The only right you have is because you were sent to this world to be the crown jewel and to take the world and make it a better place. And then all of creation thanks us because we're not destroying, we're elevating. You know, the word carbon is not translated correctly. Sacrifice is not the word carbon. Carbon means offering. As a matter of fact, it comes from the word kiruv, to bring closer. So the commentaries explain, and especially the Kabbalistic and, and Hasidic texts, that it's elevating. So you'll say, why does it have to come in the shape of killing? Maybe it's not called killing. Maybe it is just a matter of transforming something into a greater place. So that's the general gist of it. So if you do the right thing, then you're the crown jewel and greater than all of the world. But if you misbehave, you're, you're even more inferior to an insect because an insect has not transgressed. So that's the general answer to the idea that we don't have a right to touch not mineral, not vegetable, not animal, and definitely not in the context of offerings. Our job is to elevate. I would like to see the greatest environmentalists of our time, do they have the sensitivity to a leaf? that the Torah has. And the fact that many of us uh, don't have that sensitivity, that's simply our callousness. That's not what's expected of us. Okay, so it really comes down to why, the world, why these items in the world were created in the first place, and when you use them for which they were created, then actually you're fulfilling their purpose and not destroying it. If you like that video, hit the subscribe button and notification bell below for hours of the best Jewish content online.